death to your life yeah. when you say it. Yeah. Well, he, you know, you have to when you're when you're interpreting the scripture, you always have to you always have to see what he's saying to whom, right? And for what purpose? That's right. What he said when he was on the earth was to the Jewish people for the reason of bringing all. them to the end of themselves. Yeah. Because he was there, the change, the transition was him. That's right. And so he had to he had to to minister what was they, what was going to bring about the process that, that he wanted to bring about, and, and uh, so. Thankful for those that are this morning that may be watching us. I see hi Mary. Happy Resurrection Day to y'all in the, in the Show Me State up in Missouri. Uh, we're going to show you this morning. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but happy to have everybody that's that's tuning in. We're just thankful for those that could be here. I know there's a lot of people with families and things going on. So uh, the message this morning, of course, this is Resurrection Day, so it's about the resurrection and the life. And notice the and there. You know, it's not just about, you know, the resurrection is a, is a wonderful uh, truth. But without the life that it brings, then the purpose becomes, becomes uh, unfulfilled in, in God's heart, in, in the heart of his son, in the Holy Spirit. The Trinity, uh, the purpose of the Trinity, which we've looked at many times in Ephesians, uh, it's the, the will of the Father, the work of the Son, and the witness of the Holy Spirit is all designed to bring life due to, God, to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So without the life, the, the resurrection can't fulfill the design purpose of, of God, the Godhead. He wants us to, to have the life that's associated with the resurrection, and that's what you're, that's what you're talking about this morning. Uh, and so uh, Jesus wants, I wrote this down this morning, Jesus wants his life to become your life so that your life can become his life in you. Yeah. I'll say that one more time. Jesus wants his life to become your life so that your life can become his life because he's the one now living in you. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. So the life that I now live is by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. So it's, it's no longer I. And I, I wrote that there's a transition uh, by the, the mercy of God, by the grace of God. It's, you know, it's not me. It's not even Christ in me. It's Christ alone. It's Christ alone. That's, that's the ultimate end of ourselves when it becomes all him and not, not me, not us. Amen? Uh, so um, I'm thankful that Jesus was a complete failure when it came to funerals, right? <laughs> His own. <laughs> uh, he never could really show up at a funeral. <laughs> Because uh, it would no longer be a funeral, would it? Uh, and you know, this you know, he went. I imagine it was hard for him for 30 years to go, to to go and be involved in stuff, you know. And then once the once the anointing of the Holy Spirit came and they hit, and his identity was being revealed, his his life was being revealed, the life that we now have, then uh, funerals became kind of obsolete when he was around. And I'm so thankful for that, including his own. Um, and uh, so this morning, I just want to talk a little bit about that, um, uh, starting in John chapter 11. I'm not going to read the chapter because we've talked about it many times, but it's the, it's the, it's the uh, chapter about Lazarus, uh, which was the friend, a real close friend of Jesus, um, and Mary and Martha, his two sisters. And Lazarus was uh, born in Bethany. His name means God has helped, and he was, born, he was born in a town that means a house of misery. We were all born in that, that the house of misery. We were born of a seed that was corrupted uh, from the first Adam. And this is what we're going to talk about, is that once we rec recognize, we can't have life. We can't have life this morning unless we understand the distinction between the first Adam and the last Adam. Mm -hmm. and let, until we split the atoms, we're not going to truly understand the power that's available to us through the life, the resurrection life of Jesus. You've yeah. got to make that cut between the old Adam and the last Adam, the first Adam and the last Adam. And that's what he wants to sever in our hearts. That's the, that's the true circumcision of the heart that cuts off the old connection to a corruptible seed, a corruptible tree, and a, and a, a corruption in the blood. His blood was corrupted. His seed is corrupted. And that tree that he ate from that corrupted him, it, called blood, it caused blood poisoning. Uh, Adam's, Adam's blood became poisoned because he ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and it poisoned the, the, the seed that, that, was, that came through Adam 
That's why Mary gave birth to Jesus as a woman. It wasn't, it had nothing to do with the, the seed of, of Adam. And there has to be a transition here. I'm going to start preaching right away, if that's okay. But Lazarus is a good example of the fact that uh, in the first section of your notes there, it's really, it's really important to understand this, really important to understand the power of the resurrection, the power of the blood of Jesus. You know, we, we're, we're, I'm seeing more and more a, a, a gospel that's trying to be preached that's a bloodless gospel. That's, yeah. that's moving us away from the fact that somehow everybody's offended by, by blood, but without this, this example that he used through the Old Testament and, and culminating in, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we would have no life this morning. And so um, 900 times the Bible talks about blood. So it's not like a random subject that is there once or twice and we can kind of throw it out to make it sound like God doesn't need that. He didn't need Jesus to die. Jesus did it, just did it because he wanted us to feel better about our soul, our soul realm. No, there was a, there was a, there was a need there that we have to understand if we're going to walk in the power of his resurrection. So Lazarus was, was uh, allowed by Jesus. He, he delayed him the lady, he found out Lazarus was sick. He waited four days. Um, there's a lot of things you can draw out of that as well. But Lazarus died. He came, uh, he came to wake him up. He said, I'm going to go wake him up. So, well, if he's just sleeping, we don't need to go over there. He said, he's dead. I'm going to go wake him up. So he comes over to wake him. He's going to go and he encounters the Martha and Mary, the two sisters, come running out. And this is the first scripture in, in, in the notes, John 11, 24 and 25. This is the Passion Translation, and I hope... Um, the Passion Translation has really given me a passion yeah. about the about the translation this translation of the of the truth of the word. Amen. Mm -hmm. Anybody reading it? It's it's yeah. just mm -hmm. uh, we're going to start looking at, at Hebrews a little bit in it, and I've been reading it in the Passion. It's just amazing. Um, Martha, he comes. Martha comes running out and said, "Jesus, if you'd have just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you'd have just been here." And uh, and, and then Jesus says to her, but he, he's going to rise again. And she, and she said, yes, I know he's going to rise uh, like everyone else in the resurrection day. And he said, Martha, you don't have to wait until then. We don't have to wait until we're, we, we die to have resurrection life, mm -hmm. is what he was trying to say to her. Resurrection mm -hmm. life was a part of what he wanted to bring to us before we die. And so that's what he said to her. You don't have to wait until then. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Right now, I'm the resurrection and the life. Mm -hmm. And I want, to be, I want to be the resurrection in your life, and I want, to be the life, I want to be the life that follows that resurrection life in your life. I want to be the power source of your life because it's moving, the power source is moving from you to the spirit of, of the living God being in you. And so this is such an important thing for, for us to understand what is our part? Well, we talked about this several times. What our part, if you look at the story of them, what does he say? What does he say to the people that are gathered there that are witnessing the resurrection? What does he say to them first? I'm binding and letting go. Well, what does he say first though? Oh, well, rise. Rise. Now what's our part? Keep the stone. Roll the stone away. Oh, we gotta you gotta get rid of the old system. The law. You gotta get rid of what he was dead and buried behind in his death. That was representing what we were all dead in, which is our trespasses and, and the corruption, that old system that could never make us right with him, could never never make us holy, could never make us righteous. Yeah. It was never given to make us righteous. Jesus came to say that. It was never given to, so that we could live holy lives by trying to obey rules. Okay. It came to show us, hey, mm -hmm. this is hopeless. Mm -hmm. right. But now we have a hope, a living hope, mm -hmm. that's coming to give us the solution to that hopelessness. And so, but see, so the person before a person can be re receive resurrection life today, right now, you can receive resurrection life. You don't have to you don't have to wait till we're resurrected at the end. You can receive it right now. But the first step is that that stone has to be rolled away. That old system has to be detached from you. And you have to be dead to it, and that's why he lets Lazarus be buried behind it. You have, you have to we have to be dead to the law. We have to be dead to the first Adam. We have to be dead to our connection to the corrupted seed and the corrupted blood. Amen? Amen? We have to be dead to that. So that was the first thing. And then once he removed, we removed the stone, the old corrupted system, from, our, from the heart of a person, 
What's the second part is his part. What does he do? Lazarus, come forth. Melissa, come forth. Deborah, James. He's spoken when you believe the truth of the gospel and you detach yourself from the old system of that stone dead life of rules and regulations that can that he put that he nailed to the cross to, to remove from your from your thoughts of ever being uh, able to uh, accomplish that. When he nailed that, that's Colossians 2, when he nailed that handwriting of, of ordinances that was against us and contrary to us, it couldn't save us. When we, when we get to that place where we've destroyed that, that whole mentality of the old Adam and our hopeless, our hopeless endeavor to be good and to try to do good and try to please God and make him happy with us and somehow make somehow if I think if I can be satisfied and satisfy him enough that he one day he'll let me in the uh, St. Peter will let me come in. That's that's not the gospel. And that's why the gospel is good news, right? But none of that was good news. None of that's sad news. That's that's sad tidings that bring great sorrow. So when when he when we remove that in our life then Jesus says Lazarus, come forth. You come forth to a new resurrected life. In that moment, Lazarus, the illustration there was he was being raised from the dead of that life behind the law that was dead and uh, under trespasses and sin. And he was receiving a life, uh, a, a resurrection life in that moment. That's why he says, you know, you don't have to wait until then. You don't have to wait until the last day, the resurrection at the end of the time. He, he won't. The resurrection doesn't mean much if it doesn't help us in live a resurrection life now, does it? What's the point? That we celebrate it. The whole world this morning is celebrating the resurrection, but they're not living the resurrection life. They're still being taught to live behind the stones. Still dead. Nobody's rolled a stone away. So they're still living in the, behind a stone and living a life that's dead, hoping for a resurrection someday in the, in the great by and by. Amen? Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm preaching to the choir mostly this morning, but that's okay. Uh, there may be somebody that's not part of the choir that's listening in. Hi, Kim, and I see several there. So, um, uh, then, the, uh, then, then what's the last part? What is the, the the last part after we're resurrected? Then there's another part that we play in the in the in the, the expression of, of of resurrection life. Ephesians chapter uh, four. Ephesians chapter four, verse twenty nine. And um, Susan, you said it just a minute ago. What's the... Oh, then uh, loose him and let him go. Loose, loose, loose him. him. Yeah. He came, he came, Lazarus came bound, so he came out from behind the life of the death behind the stone. He was resurrected on the inside, but he was bound on the outside. His mind was still bound. So what did he tell the people to do? loose him from the grave clothes that's that's what i feel like my ministry you know i, I just felt a, tr a draw to that since i started this years ago 13 14 years ago mm -hmm. was to loose people from the, the the what they were bound in with religion mm -hmm. to loose those grave clothes they're resurrected mm -hmm. they need to be free from the old life from that old system they need to be free from it and so it says he says let no corrupt uh, word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification. You know, net edification is necessary this morning. Amen. I come here this morning, I came here this morning because I needed to be edified. I need to be built up in what I know the truth to be of the gospel. Amen. I need somebody to tell me when I may not be believing it 100%, I need to be somebody to tell me the truth that I may, because I may be believing a lie. And I don't wanna live in a lie. I'm gonna live in the truth. You gave a good example of that this morning. Yeah. So uh, that's what that's the two parts. That's his part is the resurrection part. We've got to deliver people from the life, or from roll away the stone, and then re once they're resurrected, remind them that their life is now detached from the old Adam. Uh, this morning, uh, I saw a thing um, from Spurgeon, and it said, "The same gospel that saves sinners feeds saints." The same gospel that. Safe sinners feed saints. Yeah, it's the right. truth. Yeah, the truth is what makes us free, that's right. and the truth is what keeps us free. Yeah. That's right. So Amen. when we when we're proceeding, uh, when we let cor uh, corrupt words proceed out of our mouths, and what we're telling a person is they're being they're being, God is is uh, uh, accepting them based upon how they're living, how well they're doing, what they're yeah. what they're accomplishing in their own strength. That's called religion. 
Jesus didn't come to give us religion. He came to remove religion. Jesus came to remove religion. People need to hear that this morning because they think religion is something that, that saves people. And that all it does is keeps them in bondage because religion started at the tree of knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. Man was never intended to eat that from that tree. The, the tree of life was there, and now we get to, we get to eat from Jesus in his life. Um, so that's the part Jesus is a resurrection but we have those two parts we've got it to give somebody the truth of the gospel we have to get them to be become dead to the old system we have to roll the stone away from their life they can't even see it unless we do that and that's what Jesus was trying to do on the earth was he was trying to remove any hope of self-righteousness or self-justification the Sermon on the Mount was not a, to make us to hold us to a standard he was showing us a standard we couldn't hold up to I see. I couldn't say that again if I tried, but y'all got it, right? You got it. Yeah. You got it. Uh, so that's uh, no matter what we would have tried to, could have tried to do, and that's what he came to show us. And and what he did is, and, and instead of sending stone, cold stones down that mountain that he was on, he came down himself and says, "I've got this. I'm going to do for you what you cannot do for yourself." Amen. And that's the gospel. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Uh, couldn't even come close. Now, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 18, this is the Passion Translation. In other words, just as condemnation came upon all people through one transgression, so through one righteous act of Jesus' sacrifice, the perfect righteousness that makes us right with God and leads us to a what? Victorious life. Anybody want a victorious life? This Amen. This is what leads us there. Uh, is now available to all. One man's disobedience opened the door for all humanity to become sinners. You didn't become a sinner because you sinned. You became a sinner ultimately because Ad, the first Adam sinned. And you were born of his seed and his blood. His blood was corrupted. His seed line was, it was corrupted. Uh, but we have a new seed line. Uh, that's, and I want to make this distinction as we go along here. And if you see this, I mean, hallelujah, God... You know, the Holy Spirit witnessed to our hearts this morning that the, the, the power that's available when we split the atoms. I mean, the, the world is a good example. When, when, they, when the atoms were split, when the hydrogen atom was split, the hydrogen bomb was, was made, look at the power that was unleashed. That's nothing compared to what this is. When you unleash the power, when you split that old atom off and you, and you become a part of the new atom, the, 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 the power that's available in that is, is beyond our understanding, but the Holy Spirit's trying to give it to us. He's, he's, he's trying to, to give us as we, as we learn about our new creation in Christ. Uh, all, um, one man's disobedience opened the door for all humanity to become sinners. So also one man's obedience, God's not interested in how obedient we are, He's interested as, as whether we're accepting Christ's obedience in our place because the more we do that, the more obedient we're going to become because we're not trying to impress God anymore. We're trying to walk in what he's given us as a gift. Amen. Everybody see that? Yes. It's not we're not saying, oh, you can do whatever you want. You want to change it, so yes, in a way, you get to do what you want because as he changes your heart and circumcises the old Adam out of your life, then you'll become a new the expression of the, new, the, the last Adam, which is Jesus, and your obedience will become a, a fruit in your life rather than a struggle. Anybody struggle with obedience in the past? Mm -hmm. Thinking that that was what God was interested in? You're up and then you're at the bottom. You're an M&M. &M. <laughs> you're mean or miserable. That's right. You're going to be one of those two, and that's the root of bitterness that we're going to talk about here in a minute, that corrupts life in, under grace, under the new, new, new Adam, the last Adam. So what does this process accomplish? It's... it's uh, it's, it's to separate us from every part of Adam's death and, and bring us into every part of Jesus' life, his resurrection Amen. life. It's Amen. to separate us once and for all. You are dead to the law through the body of Christ. You are dead to it. That's what Lazarus was representing. You're dead to it. When that stone is rolled, around, well, rolled away and he, come, he brings us forth, we're dead to that old system. And that's why we have to get the mentality of the old system out. That's why the, the grave clothes had to be removed. He was as free as he could, was ever going to be when he came out of that grave. But he didn't know it until somebody told him. 
the freedom we have in Christ. Amen? Amen. This is, you know, Jesus is a life-giving spirit. Amen. Amen. He's not a living soul, not a living being that gave natural life. He wants to give you supernatural life. It's a supernatural seed. And if your life is, if you're not living in a powerful joy, then it's all, it's only because we don't under we don't comprehend the power of the of the resurrection and the power of the blood. I mean, some people say, "Oh, well, that's okay. I'll, I'm I'm kind of satisfied where I am." Well. Um, I don't think we really are. Otherwise, I mean, we're, we've been watching March Madness a little bit, the basketball games. You know, they can come up to the last second, and one guy th throws a long half-court shot, makes it, and they win. But even so, even if they win, a Tuesday week, they're going to be starting all over again. A week from Tuesday, they'll celebrate the trophy for a week, and then they're, then they're all back on the same level again. See, we're all, we don't have to go back to living, trying to gain a victory because we already have it. Amen. And all of us have a perfect victory. We are, uh, and there's no madness to it. No March madness. The madness is when you lose but in the last second by somebody throwing a half court shot in. That's madness, right? We have gladness of heart this morning because we're already victoriously, perfectly victorious in Christ. We have a victory that we didn't have to win. That's right. said it's finished. It's finished. So we have we have an ability to live in in that per, that per, per, per perfect performance he had, so that we're not seeking an identity in our performance. We're seeking our identity in his performance, and that's a great and that's called inheritance, based upon identity. You smell it. I mean, I'm just smell it out. Smell it out. <laughs> you want me to spell it out? The it's, it's the fragrance of Christ. He wants us Amen. to be the fragrance of Christ. You are the fragrance of Christ. Amen. That's what Paul said you were. Amen. You're the fragrance Amen. of Christ. Hallelujah. Now, uh, but it's it's that's if we don't understand the blood, the corrupted system of the blood in the sea, we won't understand the, the power of the resurrection life. Amen. Colossians chapter three, verse one. In the third section of your notes there, Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. Your crucifixion with Christ has what? Severed the tie to this life in First Adam. You are completely, the, the enemy hates for you to know that. He hates for you to know that. Because if you don't know that and you're not walking in it, then he can cause torment in your life. He can torment your soul if you don't understand this. And I don't want to live. See, he removed, he, he died and, and put the, the law on the, nailed the law to the cross to remove us from the tormentors. I lived under those tormentors. And they're relentless and they will never let up on you until you know you're free. And if you, if you go back to believing wrong, then the tormentors start coming back in because you're saying, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna suffer for something that I've been freed from and given, you know, given liberty from. So, uh, and that's the way the enemy works. But he has been, you, you are, look at this, severed. Christ severed it. Uh, and now your true life, say, everybody say true life. True this, life. Is, this, this is talking about our true life, our resurrected life of a new seed and a new blood. Amen? Uh, Amen. Is hidden away in God in Christ. But the, guess what? The Holy Spirit is revealing what that's been that's what's been hidden away in Christ. That he's, he's revealing that truth to our mind that's already happened here. You know, you have a pure heart this morning. Amen. But in your mind, you may not think, well, I don't know if I'm that pure or not. Well, that's that's the enemy trying to, to, to confuse your mind with the truth of what you have. You're as holy this morning as you're ever going to be. You're as righteous this morning as you're ever going to be. In your mind, if you don't know that, so you'll believe a lie. And the lie will cause you to produce unholiness. See, the lie is what causes us not to, to, to live in line with the truth. Amen? Amen. Do you have something? Rhonda looks like she has something to say this morning. It's like, yeah, but you know, I want to listen. We have a lot of silent uh, witnesses in here, but I know it's the things that are churning that we want to share that. We want to share that with everybody. Okay. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is. Are we seeing Christ for who he really is? Yes. 
then what is that supposed to translate to? Look at the next part of this. Who you really are, not who you're trying to become. Who you really are will also be revealed. As you see him for who he really is, is when you're going to become, begin to understand who you really are. Because you're the same as him. You're one spirit with him. You're connected by one incorruptible seed and his blood. Uh, for you are now, look at, look at this, for you are now, if I say now, 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 one with him in his glory. His glory has been given to you. We are sharing his glory, his goodness. And we share that with other people. Amen? Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, and then 13 and 14. In him we have redemption through what? His through blood. His, his blood. blood. The forgiveness. Do you, you know, uh, let, let me see if this is the right place to say this. We have redemption through his blood, the re forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It's not, it's not according to your deserving it. It's according to the riches of his grace that was given to us. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance. So what kind of guarantee is this? Is it a written guarantee? Yes, in a way, but what is it more than, it's more than a written guarantee, it's a living guarantee. Because the guarantor is actually living in us to guarantee it. Amen. So it's a, we have a living guarantee living in us this morning, amen? And those two verses, I'm not going to go to them, but they, both of them are saying that in Hebrews 10, 15, it's about the Holy Spirit, Spirit witnessing to us about the truth of the gospel. He's witnessing to us that God's not remembering your, your he's not holding your sins against you because they were nailed to the, he's saying that you're righteous now because of what Jesus is. He's saying you're holy because of what Jesus, he's witnessing that to us. And then when you look at the other scripture in Romans 8, verse 16, he's saying that the, the Holy Spirit's witnessing in us that we're sons, that we're family, that we're, his, that we're in, his, in his family. And therefore we have the inheritance, everything that Christ Jesus is and everything that he has is ours. And Tina, everything that he's not, we're not. Amen. 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 Just, read, just read that in the Passion Translation. Romans 8 is just amazing. But I want you to see that. That's the, it, he's a living guarantee in your life this morning. The Holy Amen. Spirit's not. And, and Jesus said when he, when he comes, uh, He's going to abide with you until you mess up. No. Is that what it says? No. It wouldn't last long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. He'd be in, and that's what I used to think that. Yeah. When you, when you, yeah. you know, withdraw, you know what, yeah. you know what, what we, what we call people. People have told me this and made arguments. I'm getting ahead of myself, but they would say stuff about, well, you know, you got to have a, you know, you got to, you got to. He gave us a conscience, so we're supposed to live by our conscience. No, conscience came from the tree of knowledge. Yes, right. You know that a psychopath starts out in that. That's the that's the way a psychopath starts out their life. Is is at trying to clear their conscience, and what they end up doing when they mess up is they don't they don't they don't they can't cleanse their own conscience, mm -hmm. so they sear it, mm -hmm. and they keep doing that and keep doing that until they have no feeling at all about what they're doing yeah. so they can do treacherous horrible things and they have no feeling about it and yet they're trying they started off trying to, to clear cleanse their conscience so what kind of life is there in that but if you understand that jesus cleansed your conscience once and all by becoming a living sacrifice for you so you can be removed from the condemnation that comes in that causes you to have to sear your conscience you don't have to sear it anymore because he cleaned it he cleaned it all up for you. See, that's 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 resurrection life. Don't let people try to tell you that that you're making a mistake when you're not living by your conscience. You live out of that, you're you're doomed to go into a root of bitterness. Where I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay, let's go on. Uh, so that's a, that's a living guarantee. Hebrews twelve fifteen says, "Watch." I want you to see this with your own eyes. Uh, in Hebrews. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in Hebrews coming up here shortly. I believe with all my heart that. Paul wrote this in Hebrew to the Hebrews because they were living in a dual um, yeah. type of a life which most of the church is living in today. So Hebrews is very relevant to the end time church. 
uh, and that's why I think we can get so much in, in, in chapter 12, uh, verse 15, in the Passion Translation. It says, watch, you know, I, I, need, I need everybody in this room to understand for me what's in this, what's in this verse. Watch over each other to make sure that no one misses the revelation of God's grace. Amen. It doesn't say watch over each other to make sure that you don't, uh, that you're not, you know, getting into sin or you're not doing it. I mean, we, yeah, we have, we, we do try to help our, our brothers and sisters, you know, to, to not believe a lie and go away by, you know, getting into a situation where they become self, self-deceived and self-conscious and self, you know, but this is what we need to do. Watch over each other. And make sure that no one lives with a root of bitterness that sprouts within them, which will only cause trouble and poison the hearts of many. See, if that root of bitterness will spring up, it's, it's because they get their, the blood poisoning from the first Adam continues to corrupt them into thinking that somehow that they're, that, see, they're, they're, they're no longer embracing and, and being reminded of God's grace, so they go back to thinking that their life has been corrupted and they're, they're having and so they start trying to, to, to gain, gain God's approval again and to get his blessing again. And so what happens in that is they get frustrated and they, get, they, they, they think that there's no hope and then that root of bitterness springs up in them and it continues to try to separate them from the new life that they have, the resurrection they life, life they have and gets them back into thinking they're still part of that first Adam, still connected to first Adam. Uh, Acts chapter 6, uh, the, the verse in Deuteronomy 29 verse 18 is exactly, describes what I just said about that verse in Hebrews. Um, that, that, that chapter 29 is right after 28, that, that's kind of common, they come, 20, 29 usually comes after 28. But 28, Deuteronomy 28, I spent probably 10 years of my life in. Yeah. Trying, to, trying to earn the blessings and, and avoid the curse. Yes. If you'll do this, then I'm going to bless you. Not knowing that all, that none of that was for me, it was for Jesus. He earned every blessing in there, and he gave, and he took every curse. Amen. Uh, and so it's funny that in Deuteronomy 29, he follows up with this same thought that's been being illustrated by Paul here in, in, in Hebrews 12 about that bitterness that will come when you start when you start uh, when you don't when you start trying to live under the the, the mandates of the law. Uh, you'll end up you'll end up living a very self-deceived life. You'll get into all kinds of corruption, and you'll go back to living out of the, out of the first Adam seed, which he wanted to remove from our lives. Now, Stephen, in, in Acts chapter six, verse eight through ten, Stephen, he wasn't an apostle. Uh, he was a believer. He was he was a born again believer that had left the first. The, had, had left off the first Adam. He was no longer connected to the first Adam seed, but he was forever and always connected to the perfect righteous seed of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. So he had a, re, he had a new birth that brought him into a new life. It's called resurrection life. So Stephen was not, you know, not someone that, that had strived harder and was, you know, had, had, work through a process of self-sanctification and self-holiness that got him to, to where he could earn a position of being favored with God for blessings. Uh, look what it says here. Now, Stephen, a man full of what? Faith. God's, God's grace. Now, read the, this is NIV in your notes. Look at the, read the notes. Because if you see, if you look at the New King James, anybody have the New King James, the open Bible? Uh, if you have the open Bible and you're reading in the open Bible, you'll see a, an asterisk by the word faith. Uh, in the original manuscripts, it wasn't faith. See, that's where we got the expression, God's man of faith and power. Mm-hmm. Isn't it amazing how that whole thing could come out yeah. of one misinterpreted word? Yeah. Because Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power. Yeah. So it had nothing to do with Stephen's faith. It had everything to do with Stephen's grace mm-hmm. and what he embraced yeah. by embracing God's grace. Mm-hmm. One word can make all the difference in the meaning and cause the enemy to be able to corrupt that into thinking what's well, about my faith. No, it's about his grace. Mm-hmm. Amen? Mm-hmm. It's about his grace. Perform great wonders and signs among the people and then oppos- opposition arose. Oh, 
Imagine that when you're preaching, when you're a man of faith, of grace and power. See, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm still translating it wrong too. Here's, here's, here's uh, uh, Stephen, um, who was living resurrection life, a man full of, great, of God's grace and power. And here comes the opposition. If you preach the true gospel, just like Paul did, you're gonna, you're gonna come into great opposition by religion in the world. Because they cannot, they cannot, they can't stand the fact that somebody can can get something for for free, because they have worked so hard to earn it, but never earned it enough to be able to get it. So they don't want you to get it for free when they work so hard, thinking they've got it, and they don't have it. And the reason you know they don't have it and they ain't got it is because of the way they're treating the person who got it free. You know, Isaac's, Isaac's seed uh, never never uh, attacked uh, Esau, I mean, uh, uh, Ishmael's seed. It's never, it's never grace that attacks law. It's always law that attacks grace. Yeah, that's right. You'll never see it the other way around. Um, and that's, that's the reason. So here comes the opposition because he was, re he was preaching pure grace. And when we understand and embrace pure grace, I believe the power of God's gonna be released. Mm -hmm. I believe signs and wonders will be something restored to the church again because it's not going to be something we think is because of us. Mm -hmm. As long as we think it's about us. I mean, this is what happened in the first hundred years of the church. And then we got to thinking it was about some special, I'm, I've got some special gift, I'm some kind of special person. That was the end of that. Mm -hmm. But I want, it to, I want it to be a part of our, I want it to be a part of our daily. How many of you here take a shower every day? Or maybe at least every other. Maybe I should look. Maybe if you're Opie on Annie Griffith, you only get a bath once a week, like we did when we were kids. I mean, but you take more than one shower, right? Yeah. You didn't get the Holy Spirit poured out on you, and that's all you ever need the rest of your life. You need we we should have it every day, and it's poured out on us because of resurrection life that we have every day. It should be a, that that it, it should be something. We, yes, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have everything that the Holy Spirit is in us. But we also have Him pouring out on us and on the church uh, the fullness, the continual fullness of the expression of the power of God, which is what Stephen was operating under, because he was full of God's grace. Only because he was, and they began to argue with Stephen. But look at this: they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him. As he spoke, See, the truth will always uh, rise up in your spirit to counter the opposition of people who are are, are are trying to oppose the grace of God. I believe it's happened to me. It's happened to me over and over and over again. He's given me the something to say that I, I would never have come up with myself that refutes this. Guess what? They still stoned him. What did he do when he was when he was being stoned? First he said, you know, they after after preaching a, a beautiful sermon, and he said, you know, you, you know, he what you're 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 not believing what all these prophets said about Jesus, and yet you think you say you're keeping the law and you're not. So what right? What what, what do you think? Who do you think you're talking to? Do you think God? I, you know, you think God doesn't know that? And so they they just couldn't stand the, this this uh, grace of God, the, the grace of God in the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, and they, they unleashed their, they were gnashing at their teeth, they laid their garments at the, at the foot of someone named Saul, uh, who became the Apostle Paul. Uh, and when he said, when he, he, when he knelt down, he said, Lord, receive my spirit. What did, what is, what did Stephen get? Standing ovation. standing ovation. He got a standing ovation because he never, he did not quit on the gospel of the grace of God. He didn't. He, he and I think I'm, I just say this because I think you know God wants us to be bold in this truth. He wants us to be bold about it. Um, and then he said before he before he died, he said, "Lord, don't hold this against him. Don't hold this against him." He experienced. He experienced the the just. See the justice of God. And I was going to use a story. Someone I've heard somebody else mention this story, but. It was about a man who, it was, about, it was in a country where they had a penalty, a death penalty system in place. And this young man was killed by another young man. And he was in, he was in court. 
And in that country, that particular country, the family could determine the sentencing of that boy, that one that killed his son, the parents. They could do one of several things. They could declare justice and have him killed. The first step. Or they could go with mercy and have them set him free, but I don't ever want to see him again, but ever in my life. You see, this is where your story, but what they chose, you see, you, you can't even fathom this. But the, the family said, we want to adopt that, we want to oh. adopt him yeah. in our own family. We want to give him an inheritance in our family. Oh. Wow. Now, what does that sound like to you? Jesus. Sounds like the gospel, doesn't it? Yeah. Jesus was the one that stepped into our place and took the death sentence off of our lives so that we could receive acceptance and approval in life. Adoption, Adoption as children. He adopted us. That's a good. Um, thank you for reminding me. That's the word that's used. You can't make that. You, you can't make that happen in your own life, in your own heart, your own life. That that can't happen except by the Spirit of Grace, the Spirit of God. And, and by the way, it's the Spirit of Grace. The Holy Spirit is not of the law. Your works are of the law. The Spirit is on the side of grace. And he gives us the capacity to do something that we could never do. And, 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 and God's not, he's not condemning. It, justice has a place in our world. Otherwise, the, there's no, there, there would be, there would be no, nothing but chaos in the world. But what an expression of somebody that's gone from justice, the, the justice of this world, past mercy and into grace. You know, the, the, I gotta tell one more story because these both are running into my heart. Well, I have, I've got a few minutes. I set the clock, shouldn't have set the clock back uh, <laughs> last week because then I had, still had an hour. But, uh, but you remember the story of the, of the tribe of, in South America, the, the, Indian, the Indian tribe that had never heard the gospel and there was a husband and wife, I forget what their- uh, Elliot, Elliot. Elliot. Elizabeth. Elizabeth Elliot, yeah. Elizabeth Elliot, yeah. He, he felt a compassion. You know, he said he said he made this. He said that missionaries are not people that cross that cross the sea. He said missionaries are people that see the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, and so his wife, he wanted to, he felt a compassion to go down and preach to these people who had never heard the gospel. Uh, and his wife didn't, you know, his wife wasn't on board. He says, you know, these people are, are, have killed people. Anybody that comes in there, you'll, they, they've been killed by this this tribe. And uh, he, he said, well, how can I, how did he put it? How can I, uh, how can I lose what I can't keep? He is no fool. He is no fool that can lose, lose what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. Mm -hmm. And so he went, and of course, y'all know the story. This was back in the 70s. Got off the plane and they, they killed him right after they stepped onto the riverbank. This one, this one guy that was kind of the one in charge of the tribe came in and actually pierced that man's, and she, his wife wrote him a letter and said, I'm pregnant with his son. Oh. And he said, but I can't, I've got, I, but I, I cannot uh, have anything for you except the grace of God because that's what I, that's what I have in me. So uh, he said, she said, I'm going to come and I'm going to uh, share the gospel because that's what my husband would have wanted in spite of the fact that. So she went down and he was so moved by what, what you know, the, the, the reality of that, that he, that he had, he allowed her to come and speak to him. He got, he became of, he was, see, he was of Adam's seed, the first Adam, and he became of, of, of the seed of the second of her. And so the little boy grew up and uh, after about, when he was about 18 or 20, anybody remember this story? Who, uh, guess who baptized that young man? The, the son of the, of the missionary that was killed. Guess who baptized him? The one that murdered him. The one that killed him, the, his dad, killed his dad. His wife had actually had that man who was a born again new creation in Christ baptize her son. See, that's, that, goes from, that goes from the justice uh, 
to the mercy and to the grace of God. And that's the, huh? and that's the power of the gospel. We cannot do that in and of ourselves. But look at the resurrection power that's unleashed when, when those kind of things can happen. And I think as that, is that, so look at what, uh, look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience, everybody say experience, experience. the full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is, the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that he finds in us, his holy ones. Uh, I pray that you will continually say, everybody say experience. Experience. Experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you, look at that word, to you through faith. That's, faith is a conviction of the truth concerning Jesus and the gospel. Uh, this is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in, heaven, in the heavenly realm. Ephesians 2, 6, Passion Translation says, He raised us up with Christ, the exalted one. Because, see, your res his resurrection is your resurrection too. He raised us up with Christ, and the exalted one, and we ascended. Did you know you ascended when he ascended? Mm -hmm. Your ascension, when he ascended, to the, to, when you believed the gospel, you ascended with him. Uh, we ascended with him into the glorious perfection and authority, if I say authority, authority. authority, of the heavenly realm. You have You have a glorious perfection and an authority in the heavenly realm for we are now co-seated as one with Christ. And I put the verse in there, Susan's verse. Mm -hmm. uh, another way of saying that is, as he is, so are we. when we get to heaven, right? Oh, in, this world. in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. And see, by the grace of God, see, when, we, when, when, you, cut, when you cut, sever that connection to the first Adam, and, and you gain... The connection to the last Adam, and you, when Jesus was when Jesus was stuck with the spear, speaking of someone killed with a spear, who was our substitute, what came out of his side? Blood and water. It was the blood and the water. Yeah. Now I want you to see. I've never seen this truly the way I saw it looking at this this week, but that blood was incorruptible blood. It wasn't the blood of bulls and goats. He couldn't use the blood of men to make the sacrifice before Christ came because the blood of men was what? It was corrupted. It was defiled. It was poisoned. It experienced blood poisoning. So it wouldn't have been a, a sacrifice, even a temporary sacrifice. So we used, what did he use? The innocent blood of, of a lamb to illustrate what was coming. But I want you to see the distinction. See, Jesus wasn't, didn't spill blood that was like the lamb's blood. He spilt his blood, which was not like any blood that ever existed before. And that physical blood, where did he go with it? To the, to the heavenly temple, yeah. which Moses was instructed to do a pattern of that heavenly temple. But he said, he said to, to uh, what's her name, uh, Mary. Mary Magdalene, don't touch me. Because I'm taking my my physical, I'm taking my physical blood. See that physical blood. We, we underestimate what that really was. He took it to the temple in heaven, and that's the reason why now. See the, the in, in Leviticus it says the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. So you can have the life in your blood from the first Adam. Every one of us had that. Came out of his side. What came out of his side? The bride. Mm -hmm. What came out of Adam's side? His bride. Mm -hmm. So the blood and the water that came out is symbolic of the blood, the powerful blood, the incorruptible blood, uh, the pure blood of the last Adam mingled with the, the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit conviction of what that, the power of that blood. He took it to heaven, sprinkled it on the true mercy seat in heaven, physical blood. Mm -hmm. What is the first when you when you when you want to kill an animal and you want to eat its meat? What's the first thing you do? First thing you what? You bleed them out. You bleed. Yeah. Because the blood is the first thing that becomes defiled in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in something that dies. The, the blood is the first thing that goes bad. 
So if you can get the blood out of it, it'll stay longer. Except for one person. And that's why it says that he was never, he never, he never experienced corruption. His body never experienced corruption. Because his blood was not like any other blood. Lazarus stunk after four days. Jesus didn't. Because there was an incorruptible blood in him. And that's the blood that he went and sprinkled on the, 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 the heavenly, uh, in the heavenly Jerusalem, I mean the heavenly, oh, heavenly Jerusalem, uh, Mount Zion, in the temple. He put his blood, his blood is still speaking from there. His, his physical blood is still speaking from there. So don't tell me that blood is not important. The power of the blood, the power of the blood, the authority. When Jesus did what he did with his blood, then in Acts chapter 2 it says with that, that's the authority that Jesus had to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Because his blood was making us, was purifying us. And then, have you ever thought about that? His blood was not corruptible. It is never going to be corruptible. It's perfect. And when we, we're, we're about to, if somebody wants to go ahead and pass out the communion this morning, we're, gonna, we're going to, remember the children of Israel, they could put, they could eat the body of Jesus. But what did they have to do with the blood? The children of Israel, they put it on hyssop. All the priests of the Old Covenant could put it in hyssop and sprinkle it around because it was still, it was a symbol, but it wasn't the truth. And so they would they could they they couldn't put it in their bodies because it wasn't incorruptible. It was still part of this this creation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so when we drink this, he said, "He who drinks my flesh, I mean, eats my flesh and drinks my blood, has eternal life." I don't I don't think I'll ever think about drinking this again without the realization, the tangible realization of what his blood is and the distinction it is from our blood, from our from the blood of the first the first Adam. The first Adam's blood was corrupted. The first Adam's seed is corrupted. The last Adam's blood is never is incorruptible. The last Adam's seed is incorruptible. And we are born of that seed, of that incorruptible seed. Peter says that in first Peter. Uh, I'll use that for <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an inheritance that is incorruptible, incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So Lord, we just thank you this morning for the power of your resurrection. Lord, we thank you for a greater revelation of that power uh, toward us who believe. You said this is toward, toward us that this power is available to, to those that, that believe the truth about who you are and what you've done and what you've done in us and now that you want to do through us. We thank you, Lord, for this perfection and authority that you've given us to be your representatives, to be your ambassadors here, to reconcile, to, to be a minister of reconciliation to the world, not to be a minister of condemnation. Lord, Forgive us for being ministers of condemnation to people. Thank you for making, for turning our hearts to the obedience of faith, to obedience toward what we understand the conviction of truth to be, so that we can minister reconciliation to people. That 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 you were in God, you were in Christ, reconciling the world to yourself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Amen. And you've given to us that same ministry. God is not holding anyone's sins against them. Amen. There's only one unpardonable sin, and that's unbelief in the gospel. Uh, if you re if you refuse it, but no other sins are, are, are on God's mind. Jesus' redemptive work is on His mind for you on your behalf. He's He wants to fully receive you, fully accept you, not based upon you, but based upon the Lamb, based upon the gift that you bring. 
when they brought the lamb to the hut to the priest in the Old Testament, they didn't look at the person, they looked at the lamb. Amen. The lamb had to be unblemished. Yes. The, piece of, the person couldn't be unblemished, or why would they be bringing the lamb? Uh, so, Lord, we thank, we're thankful that we could, in our life, we could bring the, the, the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. He took away our sin. And we thank you for your body that was given up and broken for us, that our bodies could be restored and that we could have supernatural life. I don't, we don't want a natural life in the, first, the seed of the first Adam. We want a supernatural life in the last Adam, Jesus Christ. We want supernatural life in our bodies, and we want... To receive the supernatural life of your blood and we thank you for your body in Jesus name and as we eat it we're eating your body or your life no crumbs left on the table into our lives in Jesus name Lord your blood is in heaven this morning because you were raised from the dead you were resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit and you took your blood into heaven so that the Holy Spirit could be poured out on all flesh. You qualified us. Lord, we thank you for your blood. Uh, and as we, as we partake of this, then we're remembering the power of your blood. The power of your life. The power of your resurrection. And Lord, you, you, we, don't, we don't sprinkle it on our doorpost anymore. We actually get to ingest it because... We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. You've made us your temple. So we're drinking your blood, the veil that was torn. Jesus' torn flesh is the veil through which we, that this blood is coming directly to us from heaven. Your blood is, is symbolized by this, this uh, grape juice. And we ingest this into our bodies, knowing that it's, it's your blood that we're drinking this morning. In Jesus' name. says then your lives your lives will be an advertisement of God's power anybody want to be advertised I was I was like four years old when my dad got baptized and I, I went around I thought they said he was going to be advertised so I went around saying my dad was going to be advertised tonight but I didn't realize he really was see that's what that's what this scripture says that that he wants our lives to be an advertisement of his immense power. The power of the gospel that expresses itself through us to people because it's the power of God's grace mm -hmm. that does the work. It's not my anointing. It's not your anointing. It's the power of the gospel. It's the power of his grace. And, it's, and his blood is speaking this morning. Lord, we just thank you for the resurrection life we have in you. We thank you that it, that it brings us through um, the veil and the separation of, of the justice that we've known and the mercy we've known. We, we thank you that it's a throne of grace that we come to boldly, parisia, boldly, that we might ob, uh, obtain mercy, see that's the first one, and then find grace. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for, for bringing us the, the revelation of that power. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. We'll see you. If you want to read ahead a little bit, read some in, uh, in, the, in Hebrews. Happy Easter, Marianne in California, Atlanta, North Carolina, I mean in uh, Tennessee. Uh, Kathy, we see that. We'll see you there. And we're thankful for all those that have tuned in this morning. Happy Resurrection Day to your family. May God's grace empower you to live his life in you, in Jesus' name.